better keep that music going because this is the last time you get to hear it. Today we conclude this series called Me as God Sees Me. And uh, I'm excited about it. I'm a little nervous. Uh, I was just telling the guys back and back, and I feel like, man, all the pressure to conclude this series that we've been on. This is week number 10. Seeing myself the way God sees me. Saying what God says about me. Believing in myself the way that God believes in me. Man, our lives would be different if we could really view ourselves the way that God views us. If we could have the identity that Jesus says about us, what God's word says about it. It's one thing to read about it and go, really? Now we believe it? It's a whole other thing to walk it out. And that's what we've been talking about the last few weeks is how to walk in the authority, in the confidence, in the power of a believer. Recognizing who we are in Christ. Not who we are just in our own flesh, but who we are in Christ. When we are in Jesus. Uh, that when, when we realize that the old man has been passed away, is buried and dead and gone in the name of Jesus. The new life has come. The powerful spiritual life has come. And that we walk in that power. We walk in that freedom. Part of the challenge, though, is that old man, while he's dead, likes to raise from the dead pretty often, doesn't he? Uh, so today we're going to talk a little bit about that, that old man and how to resist that old man, how to defeat that old man, how to kick that old man's lifestyle out of us, uh, and how to recognize it. Uh, so that we can, on a daily basis, normal basis, walk in the authority of a believer. Walk in the authority, in the power. But that's what I mean by authority. I mean have the confidence and the power of knowing who we are in Christ. Not in a tall, uh, you know, just a, being a tyrant or just some arrogant, rude way. But just confidence in, I know who I am in Christ. Uh, one of my favorite scriptures is that the uh, Bible teaches us to come boldly to the throne room of grace to obtain mercy in our time of need. And I think, who are we to come to the king of kings, to his throne, and walk in boldly? Yeah, that's what he wants us to do. Because we're his son, we're his daughter. Yeah, there's humility there, but there's a confidence, there's a strength, there's a boldness. Well, that has been our theme this whole series is seeing ourselves the way God sees us, building our identity in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, I referred to it a moment ago. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person, and the old life is gone, and the new life has begun. Wave at me if you, the new life has begun in you, right? You're not perfect. No, nobody's perfect. If you, if you got your hand up because you think you're perfect, come and talk to me afterwards, and I'll show, out, I'll show you a few areas you're not perfect in, all right? But, but the new life has begun. Now, the old man, he wants to kind of remind you uh, about him. Uh, but when, when the devil tries to remind you of your past, I, I just try to remind him of his future, right? And I say, oh, wait, I've read the end, and we win, and you lose. But he still doesn't give up. Uh, in the message paraphrase, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 18, look, look at this. We don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. <laughs> yes, we do. But that's not what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to do that, all right? My wife's not in this service, so I can talk like that however I want. Now we look inside, and what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start. Come on, somebody say amen for a fresh start, right? We have a fresh start with Jesus, and it's created new. The old life is gone. A new life emerges. I'm praying that this series reminds us to allow that new life to emerge, that the Holy Spirit is emerging. I love that word, that it's, it's flowing out, it's rising up. We're not saying, God, come and bless me. We're like, oh no, I received Jesus, I'm in with Jesus, now let it just emerge out of you through the power, the flow of the Holy Spirit. Don't you love that word? I love that. Uh, where were the, and then the new life emerges. Look at it. I know, we are, we are, Paul. Look at it. All this comes from God. That's just a good reminder that it's, it's not you, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory, right? That, that old man, like I said, he wants to rise up. That old flesh wants to rise up. Um, but we got to remember that the new man is stronger. The new man is anointed. The new man has the power of God, has the life of God, has the goodness of God, has grace upon grace, has mercy, has kindness, has life 
has love, has all that we need is found in him. That's in the new man. So we got to stay focused on that new man. We got to stay excited about that new man, have some passion, have some energy, desire to have that new man come out of us. But that old man, he rises up, uh, you know, and I see it in my own life. I may see it in y'all's life every once in a while. Uh, we see it in Bible. We've been reading so many scriptures and stories about people in the Bible. Uh, you know, one of my favorite characters in the Bible, and I'm, he's in my, might be at least in my top 10. He might be in my top five. When I get to heaven, I got to go find a few people. And Peter is one of them. And I don't know if it's just because he just seems so energetic and passionate and a little bit act first, think later type of guy. And I don't know why I can relate to that. But for a few of you who know me, that's kind of me. So I see this in the life of Peter, this old man that tries to rise up often. And, and yet he was a new man. You remember Jesus said, hey, uh, you, just, you just said that Jesus is Lord and that you're the, you just called me the son of God. And he says, so I'm not going to call you Simon anymore. Now you're gonna be, your name is going to be Peter, which means rock. Like Jesus changed his identity. said, quit thinking about the old man. Now I'm giving you a new thought, a new vision, a new identity, a new perspective. Imagine Peter hearing that. He must have thought, oh, this is my new identity. I've been born again. I've been, I've, I've got a new, this is how God sees me. He sees me as a rock. He sees me as, as strength. And, and, and in fact, Jesus said on that confession that I'm the son of God, I'm gonna build my whole church on that and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Imagine Peter hearing that. He's like, me? What, what you just said about me? You mean just the fact that I just said that you're the son? Like you're going to start this whole thing based on what I just said? Like that make me feel pretty good. I feel like, uh-huh, that's right. Right? That's it. I got, I'm Peter. Because of what Jesus just said. Have a little confidence. Man, he said, I'm going to build my church. Peter was faithful. Look at all the times Peter was faithful. He was a good friend. He was strong. He was committed, dependable, always there. Jesus had great confidence in Peter. Remember that one time when uh, Jesus was about to be arrested and all the soldiers came in the garden there? And, uh, and the, the soldiers had come to go after him. And what does Peter do? Peter grabs a sword, cuts off one of the soldiers' ears, right? He is ready to, def to die and defend Jesus. He is all in. Jesus, hey, 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 easy. Grabs the ear, heals the soldier, you know, fixes it. Says, slow down now, Peter. Pump the brakes there a little bit. It's all good. This is all part of the plan, right? But Peter's just like, I got it. I'm, I'm not all in. Just, but then just a few minutes later, remember Peter? Just a few minutes later, after they arrest him, they take Jesus. They put him in this room. He's being interrogated in, a, in a, another room. Peter's outside. Little girl comes up to him. And what does the girl say? She says, hey, aren't you the guy that was with, the guy that's in their being? He says, no, no, that's not me. What about, where was, where was defend you, Peter? And then the girl says again, or another girl comes in later and says, hey, I think I saw you. Aren't you one of the ones I can tell kind of by the way you talk? Aren't you kind of, the, he's like, no, what are you talking about? That's not me. And finally, a third person comes and says, hey, I know it was you. I saw you. And Peter starts swearing and cussing and just acting the fool. He says, what the blankety blank are you blankety blank talking about? I don't blankety blank know that blankety blank man. I mean, he just did not, he just cut off the guy's ear a minute ago. And now he is denying. Man, you've got the, you've got the defend you, Peter, and the deny you, Peter. I feel like that sometimes. Sometimes I'm the mighty pastor of Frank Montgomery. Well, only I think that, but I feel like that sometimes. And then other times I'm like, I can't even tie my shoes right now. I don't even know where I'm at. How does I, I would think I would be done by this. That old man tries to rise up in my thoughts, in my feelings, insecurity, selfishness, anger, whatever it might be, any behavior stuff. And I think, come on, old man. Get it together. Come on, new man, rise up. But that's just that old man. Deny you, Peter. Defend you, Peter. 
old man Peter, see myself the way that God sees me, Peter. Think about it. Which, which are you? There's the kind Peter, and then there's the cuss you out Peter. Can anybody relate? <laughs> don't, shh, shh, don't say that. There's the great to see you today, Peter. I see you guys. And then there's, I can't stand to see your face today, Peter. And I'm blaming Peter, but really I'm looking at y'all. Okay, not you. It's you guys online uh, that I'm looking at and I'm saying, come on now. We got to decide every day, maybe multiple times a day, what's coming out of me. Is it that old man, Frank, or is it the new spirit filled walking in the authority of the believer, Frank, see myself the way God sees me, Frank, man, that's my heart. But we see it all throughout the life of Peter. Uh, let me read one more story. There's lots of stories. I, like I said, I got lots to say about Peter, but here's, let me read another one of my favorite stories about Peter. In fact, let's just call it story time with pastor Frank. Can we do that right now? Matthew chapter 14, turn in your Bibles. If you could grab your Bibles, Matthew chapter 14. And you know, of course we, the the scriptures are always up on the screen, but we encourage you to get your own Bibles, either electronic or paper Bibles, bring a notepad, take some notes, believe the Holy Spirit will speak to you and uh, be ready to write some thoughts down. Matthew chapter 14, verse 24, Jesus and the disciples had been ministering, doing some different things. And he says, you guys jump in the boat, go across the lake. I'm going to meet you on the other side. And so uh, the disciples, uh, in Matthew chapter 14, verse 24, the disciples were in trouble far away from the land for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. So they're just in the Bible, uh, in the boat, the 12 disciples. And Jesus isn't there, but about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them. Okay, start getting this picture here. Now Jesus is coming toward them, walking on the water. Pause. Just in case... You ever know, ever wondered or ever heard Jesus walked on the water? The reason people say Jesus walked on the water was because in the Bible it says Jesus walked on the water. I've talked to people that said, you know, people just made this kind of stuff up. And I'm like, well, they made it up just as much as they made up anything else in the Bible. It's in the Bible. So I believe it. And I believe this is a description of what Jesus actually did. So there's a storm going on, wind and waves, and Jesus at three o'clock in the morning is out walking on the water. Come on now, somebody just needs to hear and realize in your life, in your storm, in the midst of your storm, Jesus is going to be coming towards you. And he's not, he's not affected by your storm. He's not distracted by your storm. He's not worried about your wind and your storm or your waves. He's not thinking about your drama. He knows who he is and he's trying to get him to you. And that's what he's doing here. So he goes out to meet them. He said, I'll meet you on the other side, but they're out in a storm and Jesus came walking on the water to meet. He will do whatever it takes to connect with you in the midst of your storm. All right, verse 26, Jesus is walking on the water, but when the disciples saw him, they did see him walking on the water. They were terrified. Now some would say they saw him and they were freaked out. And some would say, well, they didn't really know it was him. You can make up your own decision. But in their fear, either way, they cried out, it's a ghost. Probably most people would say that they didn't recognize who he was. So he probably wasn't as close as Ray is here to me on the front row. And I can even see people in the back of the sanctuary right now pretty well. And even if the wind was blowing, I could still make them out. You would still probably be able to recognize Jesus. So Jesus was a far way off. I don't know. How far was he? A hundred feet? 100 yards, he was a ways off. And they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. How can somebody be out here walking on water? It's sad to me that they didn't at this point recognize Jesus yet. And I don't want to ever miss Jesus trying to come and heal me, help me, serve me, bless me, and not recognize it's him. I don't want to be so distracted by the things around me that I don't trust that Jesus is trying to connect with me because that's his thoughts towards me. He loves me. He likes me. He's trying to help me. Uh, I'm not sure why they were in the trouble that they were in, but they were in trouble and Jesus is trying to meet their need. They were terrified. It's a ghost, verse 27. But Jesus spoke to them at once. 
So to me, that means as soon as it was from far away, when they said, it's a ghost, and he, from far away, says, no, 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 stop. Let me speak to you. What does he say? He says, don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. You may be watching online or here in the room, and you need to hear from God right now. Don't be afraid. Take courage. Jesus is here. Receive that for your situation. We prayed about situations and circumstances earlier. Remember, don't be afraid. Take courage. Be strong in the Lord. Jesus is here. Verse 28. And then Peter. God bless Peter. (laughs) Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you. Now it says he called to him. So again, he didn't say, hey, uh, Jesus, if it's really you. Hey, Lord, I still can't see him. If it's really you, I'm not sure. If it's really you. I don't, I don't blame Peter for having a, a doubt. Because it's kind of a weird thing to see somebody walking on water three o'clock in the morning. Like, maybe I'm dreaming. If that's really you, bid me come. Call me to you. What does it say here in this translation? If that's really you, uh, tell me to come to you walking on the water. So if you ask Jesus a question, get ready for his answer and get ready to obey. Because Peter asked a question and Jesus said, here I am. Come on. And so what does it say in verse 29? Yes, come. You came to church today with your challenge with your waves, with your wind, with your storm. Jesus is here calling, saying, don't be afraid. Be courageous. I am here. And now he says, come to me. And Jesus is saying, yes, come. Jesus says, so Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on water towards Jesus. Pause. When you ask God for your need, and when you take that step of faith, Be ready for God to do that miracle in your life. It's going to take your step of faith. I wonder if Peter saw him. He had to have known. Now this earlier, he had said, you're the rock. You're you're, you're the, I'm going to build my whole church. Imagine the confidence that Peter had. Now he hadn't cut off the soldier's ear yet, but there's a relationship. Jesus has now, or Peter has seen Jesus do some miracles. And Peter, it doesn't say any of the other disciples, but Peter says, hey, is that you? He says, come on out here. So Peter climbs over the boat and starts walking. Now, did he walk on water from me to Ray to the front row? He's still far enough away that he doesn't know. So how far did, did, did Peter walk on water? For me, it was that same distance. So don't forget that this miracle wasn't just like, oh, I'm walking on water. No, Peter starts walking on water. He's like, "Mm mm-hmm, that's right, I'm walking on water. Yeah, and he looked back at the other guys, he goes, it stinks to be you, but here I am, walking on water. I'm doing this thing, I'm going to Jesus. He called me, I'm going to him, I'm obeying him. The natural, this doesn't make sense, but I don't have my eyes on the natural. I have my eyes on Jesus. I see myself the way God sees. This is walk on water, Peter. Now, we'll see deny you, Peter, in just a moment. We'll see freaked out, Peter, in just a moment. But for for this moment, this is, I trust in you, Jesus, Peter. This is, I'm going to walk on water, Peter. This is greater is he who is in me than he that's in the world, Peter. This is, I'm building my identity in Christ. I'm walking in the authority, not my own. I'm walking in the authority of a believer, of Jesus. I believe in Jesus, Peter. I want to be like that. Now watch this. So he starts walking. I don't know how far he got, but I think he got a ways. I'm going to say at least 100 feet away. So bigger than this thing. He walked at least the sanctuary. I'm just making it up, but you can make up whatever you want. Maybe he walked a mile. I don't know how far he, they couldn't see him, but he walked on water and walked to Jesus. At some point, the the walk by faith, Peter, turned into the uh uh-oh peter the i got my eyes off of you peter or on you peter to the look at my storm what in the world am i doing i can't do this this doesn't make sense 
this, is, this can't be real, Peter. The storm, did you feel that wind? Did, am I starting to sink a little bit? Maybe I should slow down. Maybe I should be a little bit more careful. Maybe I should just kind of ride the wave a little bit and see where it takes me, Peter. Maybe I just, maybe I'm not in control anymore, Peter. The doubt, the fear, the worry, Peter, because look what happens. It says in verse, verse 30, but when he saw, look at it, when he saw, what did he see before? He saw Jesus. He saw, I think it's you. And he said, come. He said, okay, I see you. I'm coming. Here I come. Hey, everybody, look where I'm going. I see you, Peter. Here I go. I'm walking by faith, not by sight, because if I walked by sight, I'd fall in sink right now. But I see you, Peter. And all of a sudden, he didn't see that anymore. The Bible says right here, look at it, verse 20, or verse 30. Then he saw the strong wind and the waves. So he wasn't looking there. All of a sudden, he saw the waves coming. And then he saw the wind and felt the wind. And he saw, what in the world am I doing? Who do I think I am? I can't do this in my own strength. I am afraid. I am weak. I don't know. God, ah. And we can, do, we can do the same thing. We can go, man, felt really good. I felt, man, I prayed today. I disciplined myself. Man, I exercised today. I read the word. I even memorized the scripture. I was kind to somebody. I witnessed to somebody. I shared the love of God with somebody. Man, I've made it to church two Sundays in a row. Woo! You know, I've been, I'm rolling. And then all of a sudden, you see the wind and you see the waves. All of a sudden, fear, distractions of life. Look what Peter said. Uh, or he shouted out uh, when he was terrified and he began to sink. And he said, save me, Lord, just like we do sometimes. And Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. So to me, he walked, he was already with Jesus. It didn't say, because it doesn't, the Bible doesn't say, okay, I'll be right there. Jesus now runs over to him it says, save me, Lord. And immediately he saved him. A hundred feet away. Okay, watch this. He shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. And he said, you have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? Now, if you're like me, I'm starting to make excuses immediately. I'm like, but, 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 but I was... And nobody else is walking on the water, Jesus. And I was the one. And why are you picking on me? Why are you saying it to me? Come on, Jesus, make me feel good. That hurt my feelings, Jesus. I have, I have Jesus hurt now. Make me feel better. I want to I feel good. I don't want to go to that church and have church hurt. And Jesus says, you have so little faith. Well, I thought I was doing pretty good, actually, Jesus. Now, that's, that's old man Frank talk right there. That's what I would have responded. I'm like, which? But that's what Jesus said. So in verse 32, and when they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. When they climbed back into the boat, do you think they just instantly were translated to the side of the boat? Do you think Jesus said, hey, hop on, I'll carry you. My vision, and I can have every right to this vision, is now, he says, why you got so little faith? Why did you doubt me? Come on, punk, let's do this. And now they turned around and they walked back to the boat. Jesus walked on water again. Jesus said, I love you, dummy. Now let's go. Boom, let's go. Come on, you can do this. I got you. That's what it says. It says, and they climbed back into the boat, but they were a long way off. Now they had to walk back to the boat and the disciples worshiped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. Now, if I'm Peter, I'm like, oh yeah, it's easy for you to say now. You weren't out there walking on water. He didn't just tell you, oh, you of little faith. But that's what the other disciple says. I'm telling you, when, when you see yourself the way God sees you, when you believe in yourself the way that God believes in you, you walk in that authority of the believer. You walk by faith. You're willing to take risks. And Peter did. The other guys didn't. It doesn't appear. You walk in that authority. 
You move out of your comfort zone. Remember a couple weeks ago, I talked about being comfortable. And people really just want to be made comfortable. They want to feel good. They want everything just make them feel good. And it's not new. It's not just our culture. I think social media and all of that adds to it. But everybody has always, from the beginning of mankind, looked for somebody to make them feel good about themselves. Everybody, it's our human nature. We just want to feel comfortable. We want to be taken care of. And that's not the Christian way. The Christian way, the Bible way, the Jesus way, is to grow in the Lord, be blessed, to be a blessing. Be loved so you can love others. Be given to so you can give to others. Have this faith so you can speak faith to one another. So you can be a blessing. That's our heart. When we see ourselves the way Jesus sees us, when we fight that comfortable, trying to be secure, motive, I'm just looking to be safe and, and stay home and comfortable and just barely get by. Blech. No, we got to be, no, I am, thank you, Jesus. I'm victorious. I'm being all that you called me to be. I know you've got plans, purposes for my life, and they're beyond my comfort zone, and I'm willing to walk by faith and not by sight. Come on, that's who we are. But when we doubt ourselves, or when you doubt yourself, you're doubting what, you're doubting what God says about you. Don't forget that. Every time you say, well, I don't think I can, you're saying, I don't think God can. You're doubting God. You're doubting the Holy Spirit working in you. God says you belong to him, that you're victorious. God says you're an overcomer. I brought with you, many people have heard me tell the story of maybe the only scripture I learned as a teenager besides for God so loved the world, John 3, 16. Somewhere in my early teenage years, I think my mom went, this has been in the 1970s or something like that, and she went to a cheesy little Christian bookstore, not bought on Amazon because there was no such thing then, but she went to some little cheesy bookstore and she bought this plaque. Uh, Now, not just any plaque, uh, and this may not be the exact one. It might be, actually. So somewhere in my early teenage years, I got saved when I was 11. I got filled with the Holy Spirit when I was 13, and I've been full on for God ever since. And somewhere probably around 13, my mom gave me this plaque, and I remember hanging it on my bed. And in my teenage years, I I went to church every week. I don't remember, and I'm sure they did. I just wasn't listening. Remember Jesus said, for those who have ears to hear, let them hear. I wasn't listening, but somebody uh, told me this scripture, that I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I think I, we took a picture of it. I think it's up here on the screen. Now, this, this plaque, and like I said, I don't know if this is the real one because all through my high school years, it was there. This was my scripture. If you had asked me to tell, you, tell me a scripture about the Bible, I'm like, uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, what is the blood? Well, tell me about the blood. I, I don't know. Tell me about the cross. I don't know. Can you tell me anything about Jesus? I, I don't really know anything. Jesus loves me. This, I don't know. I didn't know anything, but I knew I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I, I had this one scripture. Uh, I, I moved to Seattle to go to college. I studied music at Seattle Pacific University, vocal performance major there. And while I was there, I took this, I took this plaque with me. And it, it was on my bed in my dorm room. I went, moved into an apartment. I had this. And I don't know when. I, I started doing it in my early 20s. I did a lot of traveling around the world and music and doing different things. And somewhere along the line, I think I was in my mid-20s or something. I'm like, where did that plaque go? Where did that plaque go? Well, long story short, just a few years ago at Christmas time here in Corvallis, I opened one of the presents and my kids are saying, hey, dad, here's one of your your presents. I'm like, who's this from? So I don't know who it's from. There was no name on it. And I opened it up and this plaque was there. And I did what you just did. I went, Jesus, you love me. And uh, it was... I don't know where this plaque came from. I have a couple ideas. I know people who know people. Um, And now there is eBay. (laughs) And now there is places. And this is exactly the plaque. This means so much to me because this scripture was hidden in my heart. 
And some of you know my story and the divorce and my dad and all of those, all of those things. I, I knew I could, if you could see where I came from to where I am today, you would know it is a miracle. You don't deserve this, Frank. I know in my, in my natural, I don't deserve it, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This was just my scripture. It wasn't until I was like 18, 19, 20 years old, and I started reading the Bible, started hearing other teaching, heard other scriptures, and I'm like, wow, I didn't know all of this was in the Bible. I just had this. I tell you that story because it changed my identity. It helped me fight against all the situations around me. It kept me centered. It kept me focused. When drama was going on around in my life, I'm like, uh, but I can do all things through Christ. And when I would get discouraged, I remember my mom would say, she'd say, yeah, but remember that plaque by your bed? I'm like, I know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm praying that you find that scripture for you. I'm praying that you have those scriptures, those moments in your life. Uh, look at it in the, in the Amplified Bible. I can do all things which he has called me to do through him who strengthens and empowers me to fulfill his purpose. Guys, this will change your world. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Th this all makes sense to me because I didn't know all this. I didn't ever read the Amplified. I just had the plaque. I probably had some old King James Bible that my grandma gave me or something I had never read. I just had the plaque. But look what I was saying. Look what I was sensing, feeling. Look what the Spirit of God was rising up in me every time I read it. I'm self-sufficient in Christ. I'm ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses me with inner strength and confident peace. How do you know? I don't know. I just had this scripture in me. I just had this word and it welled up within me, combining with the spirit of God, the presence of God. Man, there was no weapon formed against me that could prosper. Does it mean I was immune to weapons formed against me? <laughs> no. Tribulations every day to this day. But at almost 60 years old now, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm telling you guys, when we doubt ourselves, we usually make excuses, like I was saying earlier, and we rationalize why, why we're undisciplined, why we're lazy, why we get depressed, why we get angry why we don't pray, why we don't read the Bible, why we don't go to church, why we don't love others or witness to others. We make all kinds of excuses. Like, come on, man. Let's walk in the, come on, man. Let's walk in the authority of the believer. Believe that you are who God says you are. Believe that, that the word of, is true for you in your world and experience this passionate, exciting life that God has planned for you. No more excuses. Wish I could just, poof, no more excuses. Be determined. Let's walk out of here today determined that we're going to walk in the authority of the believer. You were created in the likeness and image of God and he had put you here and he said, you have dominion. Take charge. Read, read Genesis chapter one. He said he created you in his image. And he said, you have authority, you have dominion. Take charge of your world, your world around you. You're not a victim. You are a victor. Yeah. Psalm chapter eight, I love this psalm. Psalm chapter eight, I'd love to read all of it, but just really quickly at verse three. When I see and consider your heavens, the psalmist says, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you've established. He's looking up at the sky. He says, what am I? What, am, what is man that you're mindful of, of him? The son of earthborn man that you care for him. Yet you've made him a little lower than God. You've crowned him with glory and honor. That's us, guys. Verse six, you made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet. This is how God thinks of you. This is how he views you. And you're like, oh, I just don't know how I'm gonna pay the bills this month. Man, I just, my kids are acting, my husband's acting, the, the thing, the government, and the president, and this, and the Republicans, and the CNN, and fine. And you complaining about my payment, my bills, and the, and the thing, and I'm next door neighbor, and the cat. And you're just mad, just consumed with the things around you. And he's like, I made you to have dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under our feet. Come on, we got to see that we're born again. That spirit is born again, alive in us. 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon us. God crowns us with glory and honor through the redemption of Jesus, through the rescuing of Jesus. God thinks you're worth it. God thinks you're worthy. He thinks you're worth something. He died on the cross because he thought you were worth it. Let's act like it. Let's believe that. Not in yourself, but because of Jesus, because of the righteousness of Jesus, because of the greater one in you. Second Corinthians chapter three says, we don't see ourselves as capable enough to do anything in our own strength for our true competence flows from God's empowering presence. Quit trying to do it on your own. Quit trying to figure it out on your own. Now, God gives you wisdom. He gives you tools around. He gives you people around. He gives you books. He gives you Google. He gives you uh, finances. He gives you ways to increase in education, different things. But run to Jesus first. Seek first the kingdom of God. And then all those things, other things are going to be added unto you. The problem is we don't think we are capable. Or we don't think that, that uh, God is capable. We think we're capable. We got to see ourselves as empowered by the Spirit of God in us. That God created us in His image to be like Jesus, to live like Jesus, to act like Jesus. Look at this in Romans chapter 8, 29 says, He knew all about us before we were born. He destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of His Son. What? Yeah, He created you to be like His Son, Jesus. Jump down to verse 37. We're more than conquerors, and we gain an overwhelming victory through him who loved us so much that he died for us. Doesn't that just change the way? Doesn't it make, when the negative, when the doctor says these negative reports, and they do, and when you've got negative symptoms on your body, and we have them, it's just how we, per, we perceive them, how we act on them, how we respond And if you follow the world, if you follow your social media feed and you respond the way that, you know, Jimmy Fallon teaches you at late night television or something, then you're going to follow the world's ways. If you're you're a Swifty and you find out how to live life based on, oh, we struck a nerve now. Oh, now. Now I'm meddling. Come on, you were empowered to be like Jesus. And so many, most Christians, come on, let's not be like most Christians, much less most people like the world. Most Christians, we live so far below these verses. Ephesians says this in chapter 2, verse 10, we're his workmanship. I know I've read this many times. His own master work, a work of art created in Christ Jesus, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, ready to be used for good works, which God, look at this, which God prepared beforehand, taking paths which he set. Like he has a plan for your life which is getting into the new series that we're starting next week. This, God has a, a, a plan, a purpose for your life so that you would walk in them. Walk in what? These paths. Walk in this way to be like Jesus, living the good life. Everybody say good life. Yeah, the good life, which he prearranged and made ready for us. Well, you don't know good life. You don't know what I've been through. I, I, I know. I'm sorry. I don't know what you've been through. But I know what God's word says. God's saying, I've already planned good works for you. Maybe you're watching online. God is saying to you, he's already planned good works for you. You, even watching online, he loves you. (laughs) He created you to do good things. And I believe, I'm prophesying that you are gonna follow in those paths that he already laid out for you. That he already set up. And you're gonna live the good life. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13 says, For it is not your strength. It's not your strength. It is not my strength. Say, it's not my strength. But it is God who is effectively at work in you, both to will and to work. That is strengthening, energizing, and creating in you, creating in you the longing and the ability to fulfill your purpose for his good pleasure. He's working in you, creating in you. He's growing in you. Yield to him every day. God, not my will, but your will be done. Come on, as it is in heaven, so let it be done in my life today. In Jesus' name. Seek first his will. And he's energizing. He's creating in you the desire and the will to do his plans that he's predestined and planned for us. 
for his good pleasure. Come on, I believe you have the strength. You can be ready for anything that the Holy Spirit within you, with the Holy Spirit within you, because greater is he who is in you than anything that comes against you. Amen? First John chapter 4 says, you are of God. You are of, turn to the person next to you and say, you are of God. You are of God. And you belong to him. That's what the word says. When you say yes to Jesus, we talked about this last week. Now you are of God. And you have already overcome them. Overcome who? The agents of the Antichrist. Talking about sin, demonic forces. Because he who is in you is greater than he or Satan, the enemy, the devil, who's in the world. And the world is the, just the sinful nature, sinful mankind, culture, all the, the worldly influences that try to distract us from seeing ourselves the way that God sees us. Come on, we're going to make God bigger. We're going to make what God says about you bigger than what the enemy says about you. One last scripture. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Everyone, come on, say everyone. everyone. Born of God is victorious and overcomes. It's your nature. It's God's nature in you. It's to be victorious and to overcome. Well, what happens when I, I understand? But yeah, but yesterday, I, I realized that. But the doc, and now uh, I got fired, and now I'm bankrupt, and we got divorced, and our kids, and I, I, I understand. But the word says that we are victorious and we overcome. It doesn't say that we're not going to have trials. It doesn't say that we're not going to have s stupid, hard circumstances painful times in our life it says that we are victorious and we overcome you mean instantly mm, sometimes but not most of the time and this is the victory that has conquered and overcome the world watch it here's, here's how we are victory, victorious our continuing persistent faith in Jesus the son of God it's our faith verse 5 who is the one who is victorious and overcomes the world that's a rhetorical question who is it? It is the one who believes and recognizes the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. Have you decided that Jesus is the Son of God? Peter said, you're the Son of God. He said, bingo! Now I'm going to change your identity and I'm going to build my whole church on that confession of faith. You want to join our church? <laughs> you got to say, Jesus, you're the Son of God. You got to say, Jesus, you're my Lord. And now we are made right in his eyes. And now this process that I've been talking about for 10 weeks now, this process begins. And we believe it can begin in you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap because he's worthy? He's worthy. I want to give you an opportunity right now online and in the room to confess Jesus is Lord. I'm going to, I'm going to ask, I'm not going to have you come forward or talk in a microphone, but I am going to ask you to wave your hand at me in just a moment. And then I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And I want you to repeat this prayer after me online or here in the room. Uh, before we do, if you are getting baptized in water today, you've already been, you plan to get baptized in water. Uh, if you want to slip out and talk to Pastor Bill back here and, uh, just quietly do that. No one else moving around unless you have responsibilities that you have to. Uh, this is a very important part of the service. And uh, I'm praying that God is ministering in and through you right now. In Jesus' name. Can I ask everyone else to close your eyes for just a moment, please? There online and here in the room, if that's you and you want to give your life to Christ today, you want to say, Jesus, be my Lord. I don't care how old you are. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care if you're a little kid or you're a senior citizen. And you're saying, all right, today's my day. Jesus, you're my Lord. No more walking, no more running. I'm following after you. Maybe you have prayed that prayer at one time, but today you're not living that way. Today you're kind of disconnected and distant from him. Can I pray with you? If that's you, again, no one, uh, no one moving around unless you have responsibilities. Just wave your hand at me really quickly. Say, Frank, would you include me in that prayer today? Good. See one brother. Anyone else looking around? Yes. Anyone else? Good. All right, here's what we're going to do. And I can't see the ones that are raising their hands online. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask everybody here in the room to pray this prayer out loud after me. And I want you to mean it. Whether you raise your hand or you know in your heart you should have raised your hand. I want you to pray this prayer of faith, believing 
right now that Jesus is your Lord. Come on, say this out loud together. Say, Jesus, I confess with my mouth, you are my Lord. I repent of my sin. I turn my back on the world and I choose to follow you. Follow your ways from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.